Hello and welcome to Treasure Expeditions. I'm your host, Terry Saunders. On this episode of Treasure Expeditions, I stop into the historic town of Elizabeth, Colorado. I visit the first national bank building that is on the National Register of Historic Places. I speak to historian Bob Rasmussen about the historic buildings in town. Elizabeth has a historic Main Street. Um, all of them are pretty much considered historic. They've all been here in, a, in essence, at least 100 years or more. Um, the Odd Fellows building is uh, right on the corner, is probably the most obvious. Uh, there's the Bloomer Block, which is a series of, I believe, four different addresses now, but it was built by a gentleman with the last name of Bloomer and uh, it has a variety of businesses. Um, the Carriage House used to be kind of the town hall, if you will, but it's at the very end of the street and it's, it's uh, currently a gift store, kind of a uh, novelty shop type of thing. There's a series of those in here, um, Prickly Pear. Uh, one of my favorites is the antelope, uh, the alpaca antelope store. Got that reverse. It's um, antelope alpaca store. And they sell um, uh, from their own livestock of alpacas, they sell mittens and scarves and things that are made out of that type of materials. And there's quite a few more on the street, old mercantile buildings. And uh, Main Street also, uh, parallel right there by the 83, many of those buildings are also historic to the town of Elizabeth. Um, the, the Russell Gates building is the white building there. It used to be a mercantile shop. Uh, it was at one time a, uh, um, uh, the Hudleys had a meat, plant, meat processing plant there as well. Dr. Bennett had an office in there. It's been a variety of things, as all these buildings has over the last 100 years. Rasmussen tells us when builders constructed the first national bank. First national bank was actually, they started construction in 1906 and it was completed in 1907. Rasmussen talks about the history of the first national bank. What I can tell you, it was predominantly the town's only bank um, well, let me back up. It was, it opened in, in 1907. There was another bank that was here also from 1904, but in 1909, um, uh, it was acquired by the First National Bank. And I'll point out that build, that bank building has been repurposed for other things ever since. Um, but during its time here as a national bank, it, it um, rebranded, if you will, and became the Elizabeth State Bank for a number of years as well. So during its time period of being a bank, um, was basically from 1907 to 1933. So it was exclusively a bank, and from 1909 to that 1933, it was the only bank in the town of Elizabeth. Um, after that, uh, it was owned by a number of uh, factions. It was owned for a number of years by the American Legion, and I believe it was used, and correct me if I'm wrong, for all kinds of civic activities like Boy Scouts, Cub Scouts. Uh, I also know that there was um, all kinds of retail type things within here. And there was artist studios, um, there was realtors. Lately for 21 years was an attorney's office. Rasmussen says there isn't a history of bank robbers in Elizabeth, Colorado. There's a couple in Elbert back in the day, but there's uh, never been a bank robber or outlaw that I'm aware of in, uh, as, at this bank or within this town. And that's probably the, the most asked question when we do the walking tours. Everybody wants to know that type of history and sadly is not here. Rasmussen discusses the town of Elizabeth's industries. Actually, before the train, uh, the biggest industries were um, basically wood milling and a sawmill here and also um, a lot of uh, ranchers, if you will. So there was a lot of agriculture and livestock and that type of thing. With the advent of the railroad in 1882, uh, that really opened up the commerce trade for the town because they could trade via the train um, to Denver and all the way to Colorado Springs. So that opened up quite a bit. There was a number of creameries that popped up. So there must have been quite a, quite a bit of dairy and milk product activities uh, quite a number of these uh, community homes here were actually turned into creameries in, in that era. But predominantly, um, agriculture, livestock, uh, they have a, um, I can't think of the proper term for it, but you know, the, the meat locker. 
And that's where they folks might bring their, their cattle livestock or their hunting uh, trophies or whatever for uh, that type of activity. Missing lumber mill led to folklore. The only other little piece of folklore that is no one seems to know the exact dates or location of the sawmill that was originally uh, supposed to have been uh, nearby in, in uh, Elizabeth. And I've done a lot of research on that and I've discovered that uh, some of the deeds, particularly to this property as well, go back to the owners of that sawmill. And uh, through that and some other things, I'm pretty convinced, although it's still folklore, um, that the mill was located directly behind this block, uh, probably 50 yards out from, from that, way back in the 1850s to 1860s and possibly as early as 1870. Rasmussen explains more about how the history shapes the town. This could be a very long answer. So um, basically, the, you, you kind of have to fall back on the history of the town. And the history goes back to um, before the 1850s in this standpoint, there was a lot of indigenous uh, Native American tribes uh, located. There wasn't a lot of migration in this direction. And uh, eventually, uh, the sawmill showed up. We live, uh, or Elizabeth is located on the north end of the Black Forest, which extends from roughly here all the way down towards Monument and some of those areas. Heavily forested. Um, at the time, now it was argued that that could have started here in the mid 1850s. Um, slowly, some other folks happened into the neighborhoods and became. Uh, worked for the sawmill or had ranches and that type of activity. But then in 1962, the, with the advent of the, um, um, oh gosh, Homestead Act, um, you could get land very cheaply out here. So that was starting to draw people, but then there was the Colorado Gold Rush on top of that, which followed shortly thereafter. So now you had an inrush of people. You're starting to see mining towns and activities popping up all over, um, all over in the, the mountainous areas out here as well. In fact, Running Springs, they found gold in it and that drew some people in, it, it didn't really pan out. Um, but then we came around the 1870s, all of a sudden there's so many towns, Denver, Colorado Springs and other, the demand for uh, wood was tremendous. But on top of that, the demand for railroads was tremendous. and. Um, the, there were over 40 sawmills in the Black Forest at that time. And uh, basically, so everybody was thriving and growing, as was the town. And the probably the biggest shot in the arm would have been the train. It basically stopped, the sawmill wasn't here. The Weber brothers sold the property to the Phillips family. And um, they, in fact, they, they um, plotted, platted the town and um, from there, they started selling tracks and so forth, and the, crown, uh, the town was established, if you will, in 1882. And then it was um, incorporated, I think it was uh, about 1890. And so in any event, so the train enabled commerce going to Denver, going to Colorado Springs and other stops along the way. And so the town had several mercantile buildings, uh, the growth grew somewhat, um, and all those types of activity. Rasmussen talks about the naming of the town. It was established and given its name in 1882, and it got the name of Elizabeth. That was the daughter-in-law of the governor. Then rumor has it, or folklore, he visited the town and, and uh, thought that would be uh, respectful to his sister-in-law, I, I should say. And uh, that's how the town got its name. Rasmussen says there are historical figures who helped establish Elizabeth. Well, Thomas Phillips and uh, Char I believe it's Charles Garland were, they, they come to mind quickly because they're the ones that donated property uh, to establish the town. So I think each one probably gave about 160 acres. I'm not sure about Thomas Phillips. Um, he resided in, in Elizabeth and uh, he bought uh, 160 acres off the Weber brothers, which was basically from CR 17, which is a signal up here, up to Elbert Street along 83 and all the way over to, I think it's the 135. So that basically was all owned by the Sawmill brothers, you know, the Weber brothers at the time. So you kind of wonder, had they not sold 
what would have happened to the city of Elizabeth. But they sold to uh, Thomas Phillips right basically just prior to the onset of the train. And he had the vision of the community, so they put this together and platted it and established the township, if you will. Charles Garland did, um, donated the land on the opposite side of the 83. So those structures and the activities over there were as a result of his donation of, of property. Rasmussen says there's a local historical hotel. I don't have a lot of knowledge about Hotel Elizabeth. I have some. Um, but interestingly, it's, it's unique in that um, part of the folklore, no one really knows for sure when it was built or who lived there first, or was it Thomas Phillips Ranch and all these kinds of things. And that's one of the things I'm gonna dig into. Um, but at, the, at this moment in time, it's just adjacent to the next property. And originally, if you look at the original early photographs of it, it was, it, it was a kind of a linear structure facing east, which was the railroad, which would suggest that it was built at or about the time of the railroad. Otherwise, they would have faced Main Street. Uh, over the years, it was initially a hotel, um, but I don't know if it was the advent of the, uh, of the train going away in 1933 or what, but it has since been uh, structurally changed significantly. You wouldn't even recognize it. Uh, the original structure is there, but they've added a lot onto almost all the facets, sides of the building. And over the years, there's just been a host of, um, it became the Arlington Hotel, then it became apartments, then it became, I don't know the name of it, it was an inn with a restaurant, and there's been a, uh, at the moment, I think there's real estate offices, attorneys, there's a donut shop in there. Um, the list is this long. Rasmussen tells a story about the first National Bank president. His name was Lee Ramsey. He was uh, born in Virginia. He lived in Elbert probably around 1880. That's when he started showing up on the local census. Uh, his his uh, occupation early on was teacher and then it became uh, capitalist, and then he became real estate, and then became banker. And he actually resided in Denver, and he was born in 1852. And um, when he opened the bank in 1907, I believe it was, um, he got married to, I can't remember the gal's name, and they ended up having a couple of kids and all that. And in any event, the bank itself was, um, People say it went into liquidation. And if you open the 1933 Bank Commissioner book, you'll see that it was acquired and merged with the Elbert County Bank. But that was in 1933. He died in 1935, he was 82 years old. Um, then you didn't hear anything until about uh, 1937, when uh, I think it was called the Farm Federal Farm Mortgage Corp, or, whatever, took them into foreclosure because they still own the bank. And apparently they must have had a mortgage or something. I don't know for sure yet, but all I know is that the bank entered foreclosure and then in 1940 it closed and that's when it sold to the American Legion. Rasmussen talks about the architecture of the first national bank. To finish up on the architecture though, we did talk about the veneer and everything. But it was built in a, uh, what they call a classic uh, revival style, which has an Italian um, theme to it. And, and they reference all of that. Amy could give you the whole rundown. But the uh, parapet up, up top is unique to that era. Night, I think it was 1890 to 1930-ish kind of architecture. The uh, arch, archways out in the porch there are also part of that. The moldings up on top. Um, um, are also uh, the cornice piece up there is also unique to that structure. And then it has kind of an arcade studio effect in that it has multiple arches on the porch. So those are all things that are unique to this building. Um, additionally, it was believed that this building may have been part of a kit, which wasn't unusual for this type of structure in its day, but they don't really have a way to validate that without taking things apart to see what's behind it and so forth. Um, but one important note, I think, is the significance to the community is this building. If you 
it, it's an iconic image that represents the town on all the banners, the flags, the literature you see, and so forth. So it's very special to, to the community. Smusen reveals the age of the buildings. All the structures on the street, again, are about 150 years old. And so they've, had, they've all had a variety of businesses and so forth uh, within them. Smusen talks about the bank safe. The safe, I would assume it was installed at the same time the First National Bank was built. It was built by the First National Bank people. Um, if you take a close look at the bank, you'll see some, uh, I believe it was uh, a company that was established in Denver in 1869. There's probably serial numbers, maybe even a date on there. But if you take a close look, it's pretty structural structural to the building as well. So I would, I would think that it probably was installed in 1907. Rasmussen says he values history. They're treasured by me personally because I love history, but when I got involved in the historical art, um, uh, activity here in the town, I, I came to notice that commerce is dependent on, on growth and prosperity and so forth in a town like Main Street with these types of structures and this type of history, if, if we can get it, put it together properly, maintain it properly, it will attract quite a bit of business and activity for the town. And, and that's been proven time and time again throughout the nation on Main Street type of activity, similar to what we're trying to do. So I'm recognizing not only is it, is it interesting, but it can be very, uh, um, can allow for the prosperity and continued growth and prosperity of the township, if you will, um, if it's respected and taken care of and the whole heritage and the culture is protected as well. It's the thrill of exploring. Remember, the greatest treasures are the memories you make along the way. For Treasure Expeditions, I'm Terry Saunders.